Chapter Two of Murder at St. Denis by Margaret Ann Hubbard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Two. We can do it if we work fast," said Eloise. Marmion had just returned to the third floor from her first visit to the laboratory, expecting to find her room empty, but Eloise, the X-ray technician, was spread out on her bed, and Blanche, in her blue kitchen uniform, sat lumped on the only chair. King would have classified Blanche as another of the homeless and friendless who had drifted into Sister Magdalen's comfortable arms to be instantly equipped with home and friends. Her eyes were fastened upon Eloise, who was obviously the only friend she wanted, and her full lips moved as she listened, repeating the observations she could never deliver properly, even should she manage to remember them. Her heels were hooked on the rung of her chair in imitation of careless grace, and one finger twisted a lock of hair that was tinted as near as she could make it to Eloise's glorious auburn. "'We've been planning it for weeks,' Eloise continued, giving a roll that spilled her hair wider over Marmion's pink blanket. She was a tomboy of a girl, apparently irresponsible, but, according to Sister Judith, one of the best X-ray technicians in the hills. The whole thing hinged on who got this room, of course, if it was a Spartan like Henny Penny Kennedy. Or old Miss Hennessy, said Blanche, or Miss Baxter. Or anyone but you, Marmy, Eloise broke in. We'd have been stymied. You can't walk up to a gal like Baxter and tell her you're plotting to leave her bed out and turn her chamber into a parlor. Nursing is hard on the feet, and hers have had half a century of wear, so she's got to rest them in solitude. And besides, she'd go straight to Polycarp, Blanche added. Polycarp? A sister? Marmion asked, perching on the foot of the bed. Is she anything like my dear little Judy? She isn't, said Eloise, but her green eyes danced. Polycarp is all things to most people in this constricted little world of ours. I give you her own estimate, by the way. I couldn't guess how old she is. I know my dad had her for a teacher in kindergarten, and she wasn't young then. That's how come I'm here. My loving parents thought I should be under the Polycarp influence of my first job, and I don't mind. It's near home. She's retired now, theoretically. Actually, she's busy as a little bee. Can she sting? She's deaf, though, said Blanche. Her one good point. I liked it in the basement, the big girl went on thoughtfully. I was closer to the kitchen. Eloise shook a finger. Tut, tut, you were also closer to Jock, and the estimable Kingston, only a step across the hall. No, Polycarp has the system. She puts all the little boys in the basement and all the little girls in the attic, and then she patrols the beat in between. She's at recreation now, Blanche remarked. Eloise sat up. How about it, Marmy? We're going to have to hurry if we get through before she finds out what we're up to. Give it to me again, slow and easy, Marmion said. We'd move my bed into your room, Eloise. Right, and then we'd have a sitting room in here. These are the only rooms with a connecting door between. There were some chairs out there in the attic, and we'd have this closet for a kitchenette to make tea. Lovely? Lovely, but how are we going to get the bed through the door? Knock it down, said Blanche. She means knock down the bed, said Eloise. She has talent that way. Sister Magdalen left the chapel and entered the covered passage that led down the hillside to Methuselah Hall, her oldest hospital building. It was a homely passage, such as gold miners build, in order to give them quick access to mill and smelter. For the hospital, this one, and the second, going from Methuselah to the main building, were ideal passageways. The chronic invalids who lived in the hall were wheeled daily to prayers and mass. There were only two wheelchairs tonight. Barney's was not one. The sister let everyone go ahead of her. When she came into Methuselah, she was alone. She went on to the last door on the corridor. Barney knew when she came into the ward, for the other five men greeted her, and she knew he had been lying there looking at the ceiling, because his eyelids twitched and his hand jerked when she laid hers upon it. You're not still thinking, Barney. He did open his eyes then. His white hair was in a cupy curl on top of his head, but there was nothing comical about him. And what else is there to be doing, sister? Barney, your hating him is not going to hurt Big Balsam Cassidy, but it's going to hurt your own soul. Is it my soul or not? Suddenly he clutched her hand, pulling himself up on the pillow. Sister, twenty wasted years I have behind me, 
all because Cassidy wouldn't make his mind safe for men to work in, and never a cent did I get for the accident. Do you think I don't lie here and curse him for putting a strain on your charity? It's been no strain, Barney. You've always been so cheerful with a fine example of spirituality, until now. But we must bear with this. Only the saints, remember, are given the privilege of asking, Why hast thou forsaken me? Barney shook his eyes tight. I'm not asking, sister, I know. The devil that's Cassidy has pushed God aside. Sister Magdalene straightened with a sigh. She had been over this so often in the past few days. But as she turned away, Barney whispered, I can't hate the dead, sister. As soon as he's dead, I'll be cheerful again. She spoke to the other men for a minute and said good night. The old passage to the hospital seemed long, looking into it. At the small windows, Sister Judy's geraniums bloomed. Sister Magdalene did not take her usual pleasure in them. The care of the great Cassidy had been a strain, but the sickening part was the unmistakable hatred the man gathered around him. He had earned it well, from Barney, from Philippa, who looked like a tired movie star and cooked like an angel, from little Job's daughter, who had perhaps more reason than anyone in the world to hate him, and these were only the heart. Out from it eddied all the lessening currents. The nurses who must attend him, the thirty-odd patients who must bear his disturbing presence, along with their own ills, finally the whole wide region where his name had been a byword for thirty-five years. That name would be forever stamped upon the country, for now there was little Balsam Creek cutting through Gopher Gulch and Balsam Butte to reach its brown sides where none of the trees grew, and Balsam City around the mountain. Back in the early days the West had given him another name also, Hellbent Cassidy, no compliment indeed, and he had taken it with a swagger and blazoned it over the hole in the ground he had just won from little Joe Pius, the hole that proved to be a mint of gold. And then, for a time, Big Balsam had subsided while a raw gang of insurgents brawled and shot their way to prominence. How well Sister Magdalene remembered. Before that summer was over, Cassidy's unnatural reticence became significant. An astounding number of heart attacks were killing the uproarious strikers of rich claims, and when it was noted that those claims all lay along the mineral belt centered by the hellbent, and that the heart attacks were undoubtedly induced by cyanide and a drink of whiskey, many an adventurer sold out and hit for home. Nothing ever had been proved against Cassidy. People wanted to sell, the hellbent was ready to buy, so the shafts went down and the stamp mills rose, and the violent years became the foundation of industrial development. The prosperity of the hellbent was the prosperity of the hills. Those were the legendary days when Big Balsam, startled at the head of Gopher Gulch, had roared down a mile of foaming sluice boxes. Now, down in the shafts and stopes, the little gondola cars would go on being loaded with ore, the hoist would run with the same regularity, up in the mills the stamps would crush, and the great vats fill and drain and fill again, all to produce the bricks of gold that looked so disappointingly and precious. But the mighty Cassidy had at last come face to face with the one adversary he could neither bully nor buy off, nor knife in the back. Very soon, so it seemed, Barney would be able to pray again. The sister came slowly out of the passage and into the second-floor corridor of the hospital. To her left were the operating rooms, the delivery room, the laboratories where Eloise and Sister Judith and, after today, little Job's daughter would be working together. Opposite the laboratory, the door was shut upon the stairwell going up to the third floor. Strange sounds were issuing from up there, like a slipper heel pounding on iron. That was the moment Sister Polycarp emerged from the surgery, flashlight in hand, having proceeded thus far in her nightly pursuit of dripping faucets and left-on lights. Waste was an abhorrence to her. She had spent a lifespan urging students not to waste their time. She was still appalled at the flightiness of the young staff members who, she felt, should know better. Sister Magdalene was beside the black space that entered the small, cut-up section of laboratories. She reached around inside the doorway, snapped on the light, gave the cubicle an inspection, as if that were what she had come for. Sister Polycarp watched with sharp black eyes. I was in there, sister. Everything is in order. Thank you, sister. I can always depend on you. The superior turned away, forgetting the light. It would please the old nun to snap it off. A loud thump, then a dragging scrape floated down from the third floor. Sister Polly did not hear the racket, but having finished her round of the labs, she would climb to the crow's nest as the girls had named their domain. 
Sister Magdalene hooked her arm companionably through the old sisters, leading her toward the main stairs. You must spare yourself tonight, dear. You're tired. Go now to the cloister. She could not explain that she was thankful to have young spirits housed in St. Denis, that whatever irreverence was going on upstairs was a blessing showered upon a desert dry time. Marmion would be up there, forgetting with the facility of the young that she had ever been bitter and hating. I have not been in the basement, Sister Polycarp worried. There is a leaky tap in the kitchen sink, the hot water. You have to use a towel on the handle, or you'll hurt your thumb. I'll see to it, sister. And close the window in the pharmacy? Of course, dear. Every night for six years, King had left the window up, and Sister Polycarp had put it down. The feud of refreshed air had become a ritual between them. The sisters had reached the main floor corridor when a husky young man in white came leaping up the stairs from the basement three steps at a time. His crew haircut stood straight and short as an angry cat's fur. He was whistling. Without losing a bar of the tune, he skirted the two, winked broadly at Sister Polycarp, and danced on up the stairs. Sister Magdalene tried not to smile. How many times had she reminded Johnny that he must not whistle in the halls, that he might as well learn early the deportment befitting a future doctor? And how many times also had she seen him wheedle and bemuse a refractory patient into behaving himself? Sister Polycarp, chuckling off toward the cloister wing, never accused Johnny of wasting time. School and his job as night orderly were enough even for her. Sister Magdalene went on down, letting her weight fall ponderously from step to step. The stairs were not well lighted, the illumination from the upper hall reaching only to the landing. Below, a dim bulb dangled half around the turn, leaving the lower steps in shadow. That was why Jock, in the strong light cutting out from the dispensary, did not see the sister. With no intention of eavesdropping, she paused. She was worried about Jock Turner. He had not been himself lately. He performed his work as orderly with the old efficiency, but with a new care to detail as if he knew there was danger of forgetfulness, and his grin often covered a most unusual inattention. Jock, slightly built, curly head, freckled, and pug nose, was not the type to be taken seriously. The patients loved him and laughed at him. Some said he put on his comics in true clown fashion to hide a broken heart, but the majority held that his sunny temperament was too shallow for any deep emotion, like a creek bubbling and dancing without concealing a single pebble in its course. The sister, looking down on him, realized with remorse that Jock's change of spirit coincided with Cassidy's admission to the hospital. Overwork, that was it. He had been at the back of the private nurses twelve hours a day, often answering calls when Johnny was on duty for the night, trundling oxygen tanks, helping to lift and turn the heavy patient. She would speak to him now, tell him he must keep his off-duty hours rigidly to himself. Before she could move, Lynn Baird appeared in the lighted doorway. Lynn was beautiful, as perfect in appearance as a model. There was an air of indolence about her, and the faint drooping of the lids that made her brown eyes sleepy, and the impression that her skin had become tawny satin through lazy hours under a tropic sun. It was a charming indolence that seemed to lend thoroughness to her capabilities as a nurse, for Lynn was never in a hurry, always composed, bearing the strenuous days of caring for Cassidy with a tranquillity that was the envy of little Dixie Bryan, who would be with him now, and Mrs. Hayes, who would toil up from the gulch at midnight. Lynn was not wearing her cap, and her dark hair was soft against the light, but Jock apparently took no pleasure in the picture. The sister knew why. She had seen Lynn glance first over Jock's head, then down, as if she had expected to find him taller and remembered too late. Jock's face grew hot. Holding himself rigidly from limping, he retreated until his humped back was in the shadow. In his white uniform he was like a young boy, dressed up for a Sunday school picnic, but when he limped around the corner to disappear, his dragging step sounded to the sister as if he were running away. Then, faintly smiling, went back to whatever she was doing in the pharmacy. Both she and Jock had been unaware of observation. Sister Magdalene, when she passed the door, did not glance in at Lynn. She was still indignant as she came into the kitchen. The young woman peeling carrots jumped, and the knife jabbed her finger. Sucking the finger, she slipped her feet into her high-heeled red slippers, her frown as deep as if it had been cut by the knife. "'I'm sorry, sister. I didn't hear you coming. I'm all on edge today.' Sister Magdalene opened the table drawer and hunted for a bandage. I am the one to apologize, child. Let me see your finger. Philippa drooped on the high stool, 
Her ears were pale today, standing out like frail china from her dark head, and her temper, too, was fragile. But even in this mood, Philippa was sweet. Sister, why can't I be like you? Why don't I say to myself, all right, this is the way things are, make the best of it? You do. Only, of course, being in the convent is different. Everything is smoothed out for you. The sister pressed adhesive around the finger. If everything is smoothed out, it's because we do it for ourselves, with God's help. Women don't assume new personalities when they take the veil. All their old faults are with them, a part of them like the color of their eyes. If their lives don't widen out toward God, then they become almost unbelievably narrow. Philippa nodded. I know what you mean, sister. My life right now is narrowed down to despising that man upstairs. You don't know what it is. I was left with my tiny baby to rear and earn a living for, be mother and father and breadwinner altogether. I was desperate two years ago when you took me in. An unavoidable accident, they said, but carelessness is avoidable. My man died alone down in that black hole of the hellbent, because Cassidy didn't give a damn about the safety of his mine. But the great balsam gets an iron lung and three nurses and— She stopped, and her fist clenched until the bound finger grew purple. I hope he dies. I hope he dies, and I hope it takes him a long time. In the kitchen rocker, two-year-old Chad watched his mother with serious eyes. When he slid off the chair and approached the table, reaching up to grope for carrot browns from the neat row of ten, Sister Magdalen unobtrusively pushed a few within reach. Philippa slipped to the floor to retrieve her knife. Look, sister, I blow off every once in a while, and then I feel better. I am grateful as the Dickens tea for taking me in. Where else could I go with Chad? I'm not a good mother, but at least I'm a substitute for an orphan's home. And as for that lousy Cassidy, sister, Chad's eating up the Hail Marys. The little boy, sidling against Sister Magdalene, opened his mouth to let tiny lumps of carrot roll into his palm. Mommy doesn't want them back, honey, the sister said, patting his ear. She has plenty, and carrots are good for little boys. Philippa laughed, her vicious mood spent. Oh, sure, I can always start my rosary over. I like the joyful mysteries, anyway. There's something you can understand. Take the visitation. I like to think about Mary walking all that way to Elizabeth's house, on that nice quiet road, just the same as me going to see my Aunt Susie up in Spearfish. Only I'd go in a car and most likely have a flat in around Deadwood. She glanced up humbly. I don't suppose it's sacrilegious, me counting prayers this way. Of course not, dear, Sister Magdalene said comfortably. Mary was a housewife, too, you know. The sister was closing the cloister door finally, and thankfully behind her, when the last thump sounded in the crow's nest. "'Now that's all, for sure,' said Eloise. "'We're right over Mrs. Topman's head, the poor dear. Even though she's used to pandemonium at home, we've given her enough of a workout for one night.' Nine kids,' said Blanche. Eleven. She just had two more.' Eloise surveyed the room in high satisfaction. "'As snug a little retreat as you could ask for.' Your sacrifice is not in vain, Marmy. Marmion sank down on the horsehair love seat. If we had some silver polish, we could shine up the brass on our center table, and it should have something set on it. We'll slip a geranium, said Eloise. She stood in the middle of the colored room and nodded approvingly. All I've ever dreamed of. Not until Sister Polycarp takes a hand. She won't. I'll quote my father, and the bishop certainly looks more at home in a sitting room. Eloise stepped around the table and reached up to polish the glass over the portrait with her handkerchief. Her finger moved gently down over the white-crowned, benevolent face. Poor old laddie, he's another leftover now. We've got him all up here. Uncle Josh, too, said Blanche. Marmion giggled. I don't get the connection. She's off on another tack, Eloise explained. What about Uncle Josh, baby? Blanche pushed her home permanent up from her neck and rubbed thoughtfully. On a record. For a gramophone. It's real old. I found it when we house-cleaned up here. It looks like a morning glory, under an old quilt. Well, what are we waiting for? exclaimed Eloise. Come on. Marmion followed as far as the rubber matting outside the room. Only this main part of the building ran to three stories. In a long row across the front, where the windows would be utilized, small rooms had been finished, leaving the remaining space beamed and dark, with the roof slanting down over a windowless gable. Marmion's room, which had become the sitting room, was the last in the long line, and next to it was the room into which they had cramped the two beds. 
Farther toward the stairs, the bathroom door stood open, showing light, and then the narrow stairwell another bulb burned. The gloom was heavy back under the eaves where the sisters' trunks were stored, along with the nurse's luggage and the unused furniture, and the mattress resting on a packing box like a usual of jelly. In the deepest of the twilight, far back in the corner, a Louise and Blanche burrowed. When Philippa and Chad climbed to the crow's nest, the gramophone was installed on a footstool in the living room, its blue and yellow horn gaily swinging from a tripod, the cylindrical records neatly stacked on the floor. He's the one, that Uncle Josh, Blanche sighed as Philippa looked in. It gobbles, kind of, but he's sure funny. You kids, Philippa sagged in the doorway, pulling one foot out of a red slipper. How long do you think this is going to last? Chad stood with his fat legs wide apart, a finger in his mouth staring seriously at the portrait of the bishop. He removed his finger, and a drip darkened his blue shirt front. "'That's my father,' he said. The girls collapsed into giggles. "'Out he goes,' cried Marmion. "'Hide him under the quilt.' But Philippa did not even smile. She looked down at her son, as if what he said had frightened her to her very marrow. "'He thinks the strangest things are his father.' I have a container for string in the kitchen. It's shaped like a pig, and he says that's his father, too. The poor little tyke. He doesn't know what a father is. Oh, listen, Phil, Eloise began. Philippa was crying the hard tears she had not shed in the kitchen, and her voice rose. That's what he's done to my baby. That, Cassidy. I could kill him. If I only knew how, I'd... Eloise caught her firmly by the arm. Take chair to their room, Marmy, and put him in his crib. Or, never mind, I'll do it. You stay here. I'm all right, Philippa sobbed. But Eloise, with Chad cuddled in her strong arms, went out. Marmy and sat down beside Philippa in the chair with the leaky upholstery. For a little while, for the short time it had taken them to jam the beds into the other room, and clamber sneezing after the dusty furniture in the attic, Marmy and had forgotten the long past that it contained big balsam Cassidy. Listening to Philippa's crying, it seemed now that the interval of high school and college away with Aunt Dorothy had never happened at all, that this was her mother sobbing out the injustice of Big Balsam toward little Job, and of little Job to his wife and Marmion. She sat there, patting Philippa's shoulder, while memory rushed up like a bull before a storm, leaping all the fences she had built to hold it back. End of chapter 2